Good morning. This is Frank Gaffney. I'm the chairman, executive chairman of the Center for Security Policy here in Washington, D.C., uh, coming to you with a very, I think, timely and important program about communist China. Uh, what China represents to the United States in terms of a competitor at the moment and in the future, if not now, uh, as a very dangerous adversary. Uh, to talk about these issues um, in the moment when there's a lot of talk about a possible trade deal between the United States and China, I'm very pleased to say we have two of people I consider to be among the country's preeminent authorities on such matters. Uh, Brian Kennedy, the former president of the Claremont Institute, uh, now a senior fellow with Claremont, uh, also, he is the president of the American Strategy Group. Uh, he's joined by Captain James Fennell, United States Navy, retired uh, after 30 years of service in the Navy as a naval intelligence officer. Uh, Jim is these days a fellow with another Center for Security Policy, one based in Geneva. He is uh, a man who has made an outsized contribution, I think, to our understanding of uh, the growing Chinese capacity to wage war against the United States. And uh, we will be talking with him about that as well as what it's doing at the moment. Um, first of all, let me say thank you to both of you for joining me and for um, all that you do in this space and so much more. It's, uh, it's deeply appreciated. Brian, I, I thought I'd start with you. Um, would you just characterize uh, at this moment in time uh, the nature of the U.S.-China relationship? Um, I have said publicly I think we're at war with China, uh, or at least they're at war with us. But I'd be very interested in your thoughts. Well, thank you, Frank, and great to be here today, and thank you for your leadership in this area. The interesting part about China, I think, is that even though the United States won the Cold War with the Soviet Union, China wasn't considered as part of that mix. And whereas strategic thinkers should have been looking at a country of over a billion people that was modernizing its military, that after the Cold War, many thinkers simply more or less walked away from the subject of China. We then were fighting a war on terrorism in Iraq and Afghanistan as China was becoming a wealthy country because of our trade policies. And they were using that wealth to build a first world military. They have nuclear weapons that are very sophisticated. They have a navy that is becoming more advanced and I would certainly defer to Captain Fennell on that and look forward to what he has to say on that. But what I really worry about is that we in the United States don't understand that there's an existential threat presented by China. That they themselves see us as the strategic object to be conquered. They wrote a book, two generals in China wrote a book in 1992 called Unrestricted Warfare, where they saw the United States as their central enemy and were talking about whatever means were necessary in order to destroy the United States. They talked about atomic warfare, economic warfare, cyber warfare, and terrorism. So way back in the 90s, as we were winning the Cold War, the Chinese were articulating how they could destroy the United States. And so long as the Communist Party runs that giant, great country, and they look at the world that way, we in the United States need to take that very seriously. And I would argue that for the better part of two decades or more, we've not seen the world that way. We've not taken it seriously. And until we do, and I think Donald Trump substantially does take that seriously, and I think I've read everything he's ever written on China and from day one, he understood China presents a, str a threat, both militarily and economically. And if we can match Trump's seriousness with the seriousness of people like you and the captain and others here in Washington, I think we're going to be much better off. But until we do, we're going to be behind it. Yeah. You know, I, I would only 
quibble maybe with one thing sure, you said, sure. and that is I, I think it's been considerably worse than that we've been sort of indifferent to or ignoring what's been developing. We've been enabling it. And we'll oh, talk yeah, more about yeah. that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, agree. I agree with that. Yeah. Um, Captain Fennell, uh, you have specialized, of course, in the Chinese Navy's military buildup, um, but you're deeply knowledgeable about other aspects of China's um, doctrine and aspirations and um, programs beyond the Navy. Um, I'd invite you to just talk a little bit about the extent to which that existential threat, as Brian has described it, is actually upon us at the moment. And if not, you know, how far off is it in the kinetic realm? Uh, to say nothing of what the, I think they were colonels at the time, the PLA uh, uh, folks were working through as means to wage war against us before they had of comparable capability militarily. Yeah, well, first of all, it's, thanks for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. I think I agree with what Brian just said, is that this, uh, what we're seeing today is a manifestation of, you know, over two decades worth of uh, labor and effort. Uh, the Chinese have been on a trajectory, and so sometimes we get diverted by uh, thinking that this, this all came about because of Xi Jinping, but this trajectory they've been on isn't new, and it, it dates back even to, as we said in, earlier today, to, to Deng Xiaoping. And so, uh, to the extent that they've used what they call comprehensive national power, which is you know what we call in the military parlance do the dime, diplomatic information, military and economics, to uh, achieve our national objectives, uh, and it, it, we can debate, does America have a defined national objective? Uh, the Chinese do have a defined national strategic objective and they've told us what it is and which is to be completely uh, uh, rejuvenated and restored to their rightful position in the world by 2049 and in order to get and to that their rightful position in the world is to be the dominant power. power oh the dominant the power dominant to call the shower to call the shots to to control the economic market to through avenues like uh, the, the Belt and Road Initiative, their AIIB Bank Initiative, and other things that we talked about, the, the devaluation of the American dollar and replacing it with the Chinese currency. All these things are all part of their strategy, and they're firing on all cylinders across this spectrum of, of, of capabilities. So it's comprehensive. Is it explicit? Are we, are we inferring from what we're seeing in terms of what they're doing? what the objective is, or are they actually quite boldly stating their purpose is to supplant us as the world's dominant power? In my opinion, they've told us, uh, maybe not the particulars, they're very uh, obsessive about tactical and operational level secrets, which they consider national secrets, but when it comes to strategic intent, uh, they've told us quite repeatedly what their strategic intentions are, uh, and that, you know, that they're upset about what they call the century of humiliation, uh, which is actually longer than a century, but they feel like they've been disrespected. It was a rough patch for guys who have a lot of history. Correct, and so they, they have a chip on their shoulder and they want to uh, rectify this and get back to the normal order of the cosmos, which is that the People's Republic of China or the Chinese civilization is this go-between empire. The, between the heavens and man on the earth is the PRC. The Middle Kingdom. Correct. and. Uh, so that's their goal and they're working towards that and they would like to be able to get all of their positions in these different arenas, if you will, different domains through, I think, I use the military term, non-kinetic ways. They would like to use pressure and economics and information and psychology, psychological warfare to pressurize people to do what they want, uh, the art of war, Sun Tzu and all right. of that, but uh, there are capabilities that they've created that can actually be quite devastating from a kinetic standpoint. Yeah. And those capabilities are on, on us today and by 2020, uh, in their minds, they will have the capacity to be able to take the island of Taiwan. And if you can take Taiwan uh, in a short, sharp war kind of a scenario, that includes being able to keep the United States at bay. I want to come back to the kinetic, but just to stay in this uh, current space where the Chinese are operating 
for the purpose of supplanting us, uh, becoming dominant. Um, and, and ask both of you to sort of work through some examples. Uh, Brian, uh, I think you've been spending some time thinking about this Belt and Road Initiative, for example, right, that the Chinese are engaged in. Um, building out infrastructure, uh, debt traps, uh, strategic choke points, you know, dominance and so on. Could, could you sort of explicate that as an example of how this strategy in, in the pre-kinetic moment is beginning to manifest itself. Right. For the, for the Chinese, I think their economic power and their ability to project that economic power is the, well, I won't call it a lost leader because I think they're making money at it, but that is their strategy because they look at the rest of the world and they think people just want to make money and we will confuse them while we're all making money and get them as part of our orbit. And I would say we do, we in America do have a national strategy of sorts. We have one in, in, on multiple levels, but the key one is that we're a commercial republic, right? We wanna, we wanna sell, we wanna produce goods, sell goods around the world. And so we Americans seem like all we really are interested in is making money. But we also wanna live as free people, this is a way of answering your question. The Chinese think we don't care that much about being free people what we really want is to make money. And they project that not merely on us, but on the rest of the world. They come to this country, they make all sorts of deals, they spread around all sorts of money among our, our business elites. They go to Wall Street, they talk about having new bond offerings, new all sorts of new debt as a way of bringing American investors into the Chinese orbit. They think all we care about is money. Here in this country, we're not willing to just care about money. Though, I think they've done a pretty good job at corrupting US financial elites. That's for sure. And so, that's where really I think a lot of pushback has to come. But around the world, this Belt and Road Initiative is designed simply to co-opt the elites in all of those countries. You get enough people making enough money with the Chinese, whether it's a port in Greece or a factory in, you know, you name anywhere in either Europe or Asia. Railroads, airports. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're trying to be everywhere. They're in Venezuela, I mean, they're in Latin America, they're in Africa. You name it, they're trying to be there. Right. But the, the, the bit about making money on the part of those local elites um, has increasingly proven to be a short-term thing. Their deals are often done on the basis of what I kind of think of as payday loans. Sure, and sure. We'll get in, uh, we'll build you an airport or a train infrastructure or whatever else, digital infrastructure not least. Right. And as long as you pay us exorbitantly um, high interest rates and so on, all's good. If you don't, we own it, you're out of luck. And that's the thing that has increasingly, I think, been changing the complexion of their footprint around the world. And, and Captain, I'd come back to you on this. Um, as you look at the world's waterways and the passages through which commerce in particular, but also naval vessels transit um, worldwide, it seems to me today that there's scarcely a one, a choke point, if you will, that isn't either actually controlled by the Chinese or they're in the process of gaining a dominant position in it. Would that be an overstatement? I, I think in general that's a, a fair statement. I mean, you look at the Panama Canal, you look at the base in Djibouti, you could argue that they're making inroads with the, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia was just in China last week. So what does that mean for the, the, the Gulf and access to the Gulf and, and, and their work with the Iranians? Already. So uh, in the South China Sea, and, you know, Sri Lanka and everything in the South China Sea. And then you go Pakistan. farther afield into Oceania, to New Zealand, uh, into these ports like Vanuatu and other places where they're, they're just supplanting and moving in everywhere. So I, I agree with you. They are uh, mercantilists. That's the, how they deal. And they think that they can change the world by this methodology mm -hmm. and 
we and our strength has been we've also been, as you said, a republic and stood for principles and freedom. And I, use, I usually tell people we like in the Western Pacific, we had peace and stability for 70 years because of the, the presence of the United States military and all we were focused on was two things free access to markets and freedom of navigation. Freedom. Right. Freedom. People could just, and, and everybody's right. boats were raised about right. the, the right. standard of living in Asia right. dramatically increased because of the way we've done this. The but Chinese may not do it that way. No, no. Almost certainly will not. But Brian, to, to this point, uh, you have, I think, alluded to it, but some of this has been basically predicated on the idea that business will simply go anywhere in the world it can um, without regard for national interests or even national security necessarily. It's a globalized economy and wherever things can be produced most cheaply, wherever resources can be obtained most inexpensively, we'll do business there. And I, I just wonder as, as the Chinese have been gaming this out, they've not only been you know, buying up companies here and, and finding people who'd be willing to do deals with them on sometimes dubious terms. But they've also exploited massively this idea that it's a globalized economy and the national security be damned as far as a lot of American capitalists have been concerned. So to the extent that that is operating and their ambitions are right. global, right, right, are we looking at a threat that you've called it existential, but are we, are we looking at a threat that is likely to remain confined to the economic realm, to exploiting, you know, the people who will do anything for a buck? Or do you think that we're looking at something that is likely to go very ugly uh, in due course? That's a great question, Frank. Um, I mean, part of their economic strategy, of course, is to make the RMB or the yuan the the you know the world's currency well if if you're doing business today what do you want to get paid in you said do anything for a buck well is it do anything for a buck or do anything for a yuan mm. what do people really want and when they go around the world and they make loans are they making them in dollars or are they making them in yuans when people are borrowing them when they're making them in yuans what those people can do then is have to buy things from China and so they have an economic interest in those kind of relationships. But do you really want a yuan, or do you really want a dollar? Or do you want a pound, or a ruble, or a yen? At the end of the day, most people want a dollar, because we have the rule of law here. And people believe the United States will honor its debts. The Chinese, on the other hand, are a black box when it comes to their economy. They don't honor their and the rule of law and the rule of law, to say the least. They don't honor their sovereign debt obligations. Contracts can be next to meaningless. There's extortion, bribery. I mean, the kind of economic practices China engages in are not the kind of things most people want to be part of. Now, that's why people don't ultimately want the yuan. They want the dollar. They want the stability and the rule of law they see in the United States. Well, when those two things collide and China says, we want to be the dominant power in the world, and they know they can't otherwise supplant the dollar through legitimate means, they can do that by force. If they really do have the design to be the dominant power of the world, and I believe they do, then they have an interest in our destruction, complete and total because we're the only thing standing between them and world domination, both militarily and economically. And so right now they have an interest in economic cooperation. But sometime in the future, that may not be the case. They may see us as the central problem in economic domination of the world. And when that time comes, their military options, if they're available to them, could be taken. And I think our interest is making sure they don't have that military So, option. Jim, let's develop that a little bit further. Uh, in terms of the broad swath of Chinese military might, um, could you just give us a quick appreciation of the various domains in which 
that is now becoming more evident as a real threat to this country. Uh, maybe starting with your own favorite focus of the Navy. You know, yeah, the, forces. The, the Chinese Navy over the last uh, decade uh, has dramatically grown. Uh, on an annual basis, they're outproducing the United States four or five to one. For every one ship we produce, they produce four or five. Um, and ships of ship comparable quality as well as destroyers, cruisers. Um, they, they, they're just starting on the carriers, and so some people say, well, you know, in terms of raw tonnage, they're still behind the U.S. Navy. And I always say, well, tonnage is one way to measure, numbers of hulls is another way to measure. The measure that I like is throw weight in ordnance. And the Chinese have, uh, right now, are outstripping us in anti-ship cruise missiles. So if we were to fight a fleet engagement somewhere between Guam and Hawaii or Hawaii to San Diego, uh, they have ships now that can defeat our ships. Uh, and we have a, we're in range. And they've built missiles to sink our carriers. Uh, so the idea that the Chinese Navy is, is somehow inferior to ours is a false notion. And I think it's only in the last, since I retired in 2015, that when I left, no one believed that. And people, you know, said that's, that's a, you're overhyping the threat. And now you're starting to see the Indo-Pacific commander, Admiral Davidson, give testimony. You're starting to see people that heretofore had not acknowledged the threat are starting to acknowledge it. Um, and obviously if the, the build rate is higher, there will be a point at which they have more ships than we. They, they do today. They do today. They do today. Their navy is bigger than ours. that includes some coastal vessels and No, I'm thing. talking about blue major, water major combatants. Wow. So they're, they're bigger than we are today, and uh, you know, we have about 280 ships, and they have you know, almost 400 but ships. all of theirs, more or less, are in one theater, and ours are stretched all over the world. Correct. And, so but they are now going, but they have been operating for a decade in the Gulf of Aden with anti-piracy patrols, and in the last five years of that decade, these anti-piracy patrols, once they conclude their patrol, uh, will go up into the Baltic. I was up in the Baltic last year and on board a Chinese frigate, okay. uh, the, the Binzhou, and, uh, you know, they're down in the Nigeria off the, uh, the west coast of Africa. They're in South Africa. They're in Djibouti. They're... Uh, in the Persian Gulf. They're operating out of those choke points. They're, they're all over the world operating, maybe not in the same numbers and sizes of our carrier strike groups or expeditionary strike groups, but one of the things that navalists uh, know is that when you're at sea and operating at sea, it's, it's, very, it's not the same as warfare, but you're, you're, you're in your war, war platform and you're operating in conditions at sea which are harsh and, and rough, and they've been doing that for a decade now. They're a blue water navy. They're not a, a brown water coastal navy. So even navy. though it's said that they don't have the combat experience that our forces do, um, they're getting an awful lot of other uh, operational time at sea. And I would say that space. our naval forces ha don't have any combat experience either fighting other navies at sea. So we're kind of equally matched when it comes to that in a way. Now we fired off missiles from sea over land, but we haven't fought a pure competitor at sea. Uh, and we haven't time. trained to that since the Thankfully. Soviet Navy. Thankfully. Right. Thankfully we haven't. Last, last had time we did, that, yeah. it, it uh, was messy for a long time. Yeah, and, sure. Uh, well, when I joined... Unfortunately, the right way. When I joined the Navy, I mean, that's what we were geared to do. We trained right. to. We lived to fight the Soviet Navy. We, it was our total obsession. Well, we don't have that necessarily now towards the Chinese Navy. It's just starting to, to, to happen. Let me, let me ask you to quickly turn yep. to a couple of other domains. Uh, space is another one. Are you concerned about what you see the Chinese up to there, both in terms of our assets and equities in space, as well as uh, what it might mean for us on the ground? Yes. The Chinese are fully committed to dominance in space, one. Two, they're producing more satellites and putting more satellites up in space than we are. now. There's a you know new satellite technology, microsats and things of that nature, so it's gone into the commercial realm. But in terms of sheer numbers of satellites over the last few years, the Chinese have outstripped us again. And uh, we hear them advertise that they're commercial, but r really all of their satellites, not I'd say on the order of 80% of the satellites they put up are all run and operated for the state, the PRC and the PLA. And so these are- People's Liberation Army. Right, and this is about being able to have battle space awareness 
uh, overall domains and, as we discussed earlier today, uh, satellite, uh, anti-satellite capabilities to take out our ability. They know that we depend and rely upon uh, information that is derived from space, communicate, we communicate in sp through space, and we use it to see the battle arena and they're going to take that away from us and retain their own capacity to the sea. Yeah. Um, Brian, I want to bring you into this. Uh, I know you followed very closely uh, nuclear issues. Uh, uh, I had an opportunity to uh, interview Captain Fennell on our Secure Freedom Radio program, which will air tonight, which is a terrific hour-long conversation about many of these topics. Um, but one of the things that Jim and I were discussing is there's a lot of uncertainty about what the Chinese have in this uh, one category of weaponry, uh, nuclear forces, um, partly because of, as you say, the lengths they've gone to to conceal it. Uh, what's your assessment? We're told by the specialists, the uh, arms control experts in particular, that it's kind of, as it has been now for decades, about three to 400 warheads in the Chinese arsenal. Do you credit that? And if not, what would you say it probably is more likely to be? Uh, it wouldn't really matter exactly the numbers. Um, one, I worry about so-called experts. I worry about being called an expert because so much of this is just common sense. The common sense of it is they want to be the dominant power. We know they can produce nuclear weapons. They know that we, we know they have produced nuclear weapons and they know we have not produced a missile defense to challenge what they're producing. And so they're continuing For that to matter, we haven't produced a nuclear weapon of our own. Well, there's that, right? So what, so what signal does that send to the Chinese? That they can produce at will nuclear weapons, and we don't know exactly how many they have, but they do have amazing industrial capacity. Right. And even if these are not fabulous, you know, quantity has a quality all its own, it's whether it's shape. ships or nuclear weapons. But they look at the United States and they see we've not tested a nuclear warhead, we've Since not built 1992. We've not built nuclear weapons, and we've not built a missile defense when they most obviously are building nuclear offensive nuclear forces against us. They think we're not serious. And so long as they think we're not serious, it doesn't matter exactly how many they have. They have a lot. It, it undermines deterrence if they sure. are right. not uh, right. confident of right. the capabilities of our and, uh, the, and I would just add they've expanded this with hypersonics. Yeah, I was right. going to just add yeah. that that's, oh, yeah, that's another piece of this. Um, Jim, we also talked a little bit about uh, something that has been described as uh, the underground Great Wall by uh, a colleague of ours, uh, Phil Carver. Um, would you just explain what he thinks is going on in that uh, realm and, and what it might mean for the question that I put to Brian about the size of the Chinese arsenal. Yeah, Dr. Carver uh, and his uh, undergraduate and graduate students uh, in 2012 time frame did an analysis of open source information, imagery, you know, commercial satellite imagery and, uh, and writings of the Chinese, and they basically came up with an assessment that said there's several thousand uh, kilometers of tunneling, deep underground tunneling in China where the Chinese could actually store, uh, you know, have command and control facilities and store nuclear weapons. Uh, that study came out, uh, was released. Uh, it was not warmly received inside the uh, U.S. intelligence community. I, I can at least say that. Uh, but I had always had my own personal doubts about, as you said, so-called experts uh, when this evidence was presented. And, and it wasn't just a little bit of evidence. It was it was hundreds and hundreds of pages and slides and it's three thousand miles. <laughs> well, but the, but the Carver study was very well uh, sourced, and so I think, you know, as we said earlier today, we see the Chinese building massive amounts of satellites, massive amounts of wet naval platforms with anti-ship cruise missiles, thousands and thousands of short-range and medium-range and intermediate-range ballistic missiles for the strategic rocket force. We see them build fifth, fourth, and then now fifth generation fighter jet aircraft. They're now building bomber, a new H-20 bomber. In every domain of this comprehensive national power, they're advancing in great numbers and great lengths, but 
but for you know ballistic missiles, uh, you know nuclear okay. missiles, warheads, there that's going to just stay static. It doesn't pass the giggle test. No. Well, this goes back to your point about common sense. Um, I, I think we need to probably wrap this up, but uh, there's, needless to say, a great deal more to talk about in all of these spaces. But, um, Brian, one of the things I'd, I'd like you to comment on is, um, as we're speaking, as I mentioned initially, there is an expectation, increasingly, that there will be a deal between the United States and China to address some of the trade issues you've talked about, uh, um, presumably to do something or at least to extract promises from them to do something about the theft of intellectual property, which has enabled a lot of uh, the problems that you identified, Jim. How do you perceive this initiative? Um, is it sufficient unto the day to uh, deal with the trade uh, and intellectual property problems and so on, uh, important as they are? or? Do we really need to look more holistically and comprehensively at the Chinese threat? Well, obviously, we, we do need to look more holistically at it. The trade deal, as far as it goes, I think the president will strike the best deal possible. Is the trade deal as important as how many ships we have, how many nuclear weapons we have, and whether we have a missile defense and a space force? The latter is much more important at the end of the day. The Chinese are not going to play by the rules, no matter what. The president can get concessions from them on, you know, how much they buy from us, but the kind of things he really wants are systemic reform so that they're not stealing our intellectual property, they're not having forced technology transfers, and that they're not engaging in these mercantilist practices. Well, the thing the president is asking for is a wholesale change of the People's Republic of China and the Chinese Communist Party. That is not likely to happen. I think the president believes that is not likely to happen. He's going to strike the best trade deal he can now, and that'll be, that'll be fine, but it'll require the rest of his administration to be very diligent on these latter matters, right. and for us to be very serious about our own prosperity, we're gonna have to have the kind of economic growth that we've seen actually in the last two years, if that can continue, that can offset whatever kind of, you know, lack of trade we have with China. We have an amazing manufacturing base here if we want to. For the last 30 years, we haven't wanted to. Right. It hasn't been important. And no. The national security mindedness piece of this right. is the thing right. that I think maybe contributed to that. Right. And Jim Fennell, as you're looking at this, um, my one principal concern, I must say, about the trade deal is the possibility, if not the high probability, frankly, that the image that is pushed out, that this problem has now been solved, that, you know, we've taken care of the disagreements, the difficulties, the problems with China, will obscure and make less likely the sorts of things that we need to do, structural things not just on the trade right, side, sure. but on the national security side as well. And if you were to characterize those, just to sum up, um, what sorts of things do you think we've got to be about in terms of remedying the difficult asymmetries, the, the reduced capabilities, and the possibility that we've uh, conveyed to the Chinese, as Brian said, that we're not serious? Right. Uh, when Secretary Mattis did his testimony to become the sec Secretary of Defense, he talked about a word, and he, he used the word, he said it's not used much in this town anymore, that was two years ago, and he said deterrence. And when you ask yourself, and I'm looking at a picture of President Reagan across the, the, the room here, and what that administration did to deter the Soviet Union off of their trajectory, I think back to those times, and I think now, in, in this last two decades with China, we have not done anything to deter China. So while we may have a deal that will do the things that you actually described, and I, I agree with your assessment, what are we doing to deter the PRC? 
because they're not going to give up of their own accord. They're not going to sign an agreement and say, okay, yeah, you're right, we're going to change our restructure from right. being communist to right. being Americans. And they're not going to do that. Right. So how else can we deter them from their goal of this national rejuvenation that means dominating the world? How are we going to do that? And part of that's going to have to be us to acknowledge that this is an existential threat. Secondly, we're going to have to retool ourselves as a nation and because when you look at the way we budget and what we spend our money on is in the United States, we're spending on things that don't do anything to deter the PRC. And we, before this recent election in November, we were thinking maybe we were going to build 350 ship Navy. Well, that wouldn't even cut it. And now we're going to go below that. So if we want to deter the PRC globally from a naval perspective, we're going to need 500 or more ships. Uh, and we're going to need more bombers, and we're going to need more secure, uh, a whole host of military capabilities that scare the, you know what, out of the PRC. And we can't get there today by the way we're operating. And somebody has to educate the American public that their very life, style, and existence can dramatically change if we don't get serious about the PRC. Amen. Well, on that sobering note, let me bring this to a close. First, by saying thank you to Brian Kennedy of the Claremont Institute and the American Strategy Group, and second to Captain Jim Fennell, United States Navy, retired now with the Geneva Center for Security Policy. Uh, if you're interested in this topic, and I hope you are, uh, there is more information for sure at our website, securefreedom.org, and um, Sure, Brian, you can uh, give, you give can also, some uh, you can also as well. Find. And uh, Jim's uh, terrific testimony before the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence of last May is, uh, is available online uh, from the committee as well. These are great resources. Uh, we hope to have considerably more forthcoming as this is a problem area that um, clearly we all, as Americans uh, have to better understand and be much more insistent that it be dealt with comprehensively and effectively. With that, let me just say again, thank you to you for joining us. I hope you've uh, found this illuminating. My name is Frank Gaffney. I'm the Executive Chairman of the Center for Security Policy. I'm very pleased to have had the chance to talk with you with my friends and colleagues. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>